our church family worldwide. I love all the brothers and sisters from all the different countries around the world that make up our church family. I love all the brothers and sisters, the leaders of these churches, the leaders of church families, the leaders that have has stepped in the gap throughout the many years. I'm a homer for the movement of God. I'm a homer for the family of God, the family of believers. And I could uh, really confidently believe and say that all of us could also agree with this, that we have seen the Holy Spirit move in us, through us, and around us. You know, I became a Christian in 1990 and, uh, as a college student at UCLA. And I remember listening to a cassette tape of Frank Kim preaching the word at a conference in the western part of the U.S. that I wasn't at because I wasn't, I wasn't yet a Christian. And I remember hearing the message of God, the message of the gospel being preached in such a, in such a great way and being excited about what God was about to begin to do in my life. And to see the Holy Spirit move in so many, at that time, young men and young women who were taking up the banner to take God's word all around the world. To see brothers and sisters like Steve Johnson, like Doug Arthur, like Marty Fuqua, going around and, and, and doing God's work, I saw the Holy Spirit moving. I saw the Holy Spirit moving and going to all nations and breaking of barriers. I saw the Holy Spirit moving in the open table of fellowship amongst people of different backgrounds, different races, different, different uh, uh, languages, and even different economic situations sitting down together because of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? I saw the Holy Spirit moving in our fellowship through the discipline of God. And this discipline of God means that God loves us, that God still believes in us, that God has greater things in store for us, amen? And I saw the Holy Spirit moving amongst brothers who stood in the gap, who said, you know what, it's time for us to come together. It's time for us to continue working together. It's time for us to continue to believe. Brothers like Mike Tolliver, brothers like Sam Powell, brothers like Bruce Williams, uh, you know, brothers like, like uh, John Louis, who were just, you know, get, let's get together, let's do something. You know, a great conference in San Antonio, all of us coming together, great reunion of God working. The Holy Spirit is moving among us, amen? And we need to be excited about that. You know, uh, it's amazing to me that uh, I've been married now for uh, 23 years, almost 23 years. And I have uh, three children. I have two of them in college. One of them is a high school student, my daughter, who, who just turned 15 yesterday. Uh, and it's it just amazing to me to think about that, to think that, wow, God has, has done so much in my family because of the family of believers, because of God's church. Amen. And, uh, you know, one of my sons is at Pepperdine University. He's actually, uh, my older son, Daniel, he's actually the mascot for Pepperdine University. So he is Willie the Wave. Uh, so if you got, you know, ever see a game of Pepperdine, you see a big giant wave with a kind of the hair coming up like a wave. That's my son jumping around, acting crazy and loving the campus ministry, loving what God's church is all about. Amen. It's really, really uh, encouraging. Uh, this is, uh, oh, I think that we're switching forward here. Uh, this is our, uh, it's kind of going. Well, this is our, uh, the first picture you saw, that wasn't our uh, leadership team in the Lifeway region. This is our leadership team in the Lifeway region that we get to work together with. Some of those people you recognize, and it's really an honor to work uh, together with them. Uh, this is a uh, picture of uh, a brother that I think I have to mention because he has been in my life uh, in a disciple relationship for uh, 23 of the 25 years, or wait, 25 years of the, 26 years of the 28 years I've been a Christian. He has been in my life, and so I really want to, you know, thank Marty for all that he's done uh, to teach me how to think and how to live the life of Christ, amen. Uh, you know, I'm excited to be able to serve in uh, the L.A. Church, almost 5,700 disciples uh, that work in a proud partnership of collaboration. You know, L.A. has always worked in a regional and sectorized leadership, uh, be, but we are one church with a, with a unified leadership and who have worked hard to build our unified partnership. Uh, we have one central bank account. We have one financial administration. We have one board of directors. Uh, we have one leadership ministry council that meets together on a monthly basis of evangelists and elders to talk about the, the church in L.A. to deal with issues. And let me tell you, we have some issues. You might have heard of some of them. And we're working through them together, amen? 
You know, the LA Church supports missions in Eurasia, Middle East, Asia Pacific, the Baltic Nordics, Korea, Outer Mongolia, and Mexico, Central America. Uh, last year, we collectively gave uh, $1,600,000 to missions, over $224,000 to Hope Worldwide, unrestricted giving. Does not include what we give for disaster relief. These are brothers and sisters who love God, who love our fellowship, who want all of us to do great things for God. Amen. Uh, we have an annual uh, camp for youth, uh, fifth through uh, eighth graders, of over 700 kids. So many that we had to split it into two camps. Uh, we have uh, an incredible camp for teens, high school, over 500 kids. Other kids that come from other parts of the world to be part of that teen camp. Uh, of God working together. We have, we've had an explosion of young teens being baptized all throughout the Los Angeles church. And it's really incredible to be able to, because a lot of us know each other from the college ministry, from the time we grew up together. It's incredible just to, to drive to different places because one of our friend's kids is getting baptized. You know, and it's just so exciting to see God moving. This is, there, there's a vibrant Spanish language ministry that when we meet together, it's over 800 people strong, 1,100 people strong, amen? 450 people at our Span, annual Spanish uh, language uh, couples romance retreat. Our singles gather th together throughout the year. I, I'm super proud of our college ministry. Uh, you know, they meet uh, twice a month as a ministry team of all the different college ministries around Los Angeles. They plan, they strategize. Uh, this last summer, there was a, a mission challenge to send students uh, to Guadalajara, Mexico, Korea, Korea, Jordan, Lebanon, and next year we're planning to send students to Estonia to go out there and just go preach the word and help and encourage those churches. Amen. Uh, this is a picture of the L.A. School of Ministry and Missions. Uh, you can see there our school president, Reese Nealon. He likes that, you know, he likes to be called the president of the school. Uh, our dean is uh, Greg Moretzky. Uh, we have a next generation coordinator, Stuart Maines, who really does a lot of the work to get these students sign up to, to, to do this and to be trained in the Bible. Amen. Uh, and with uh, visiting Professor Nick Zola from Pepperdine University. Uh, you know, but we have issues as a church. But we're working together to see God work in a powerful way. Next year, we're planning a, uh, a, a service celebration of our 30th anniversary of the Los Angeles Church. And let me tell you, that's going to be amazing, amen. It's going to be a great time. Uh, this is our uh, Pacific Southwest family of churches. Brothers and sisters in, that serve our uh, over 10,000 members of the Pacific Southwest with incredible hearts, incredible spirit. Last night we met with a lot of the delegates from that group. Incredible group of people that love God and love our church family worldwide. Amen. One of the best things I have done, the very best thing I have done in my spiritual walk since I became a Christian is uh, be able to join and, uh, uh, this cohort in the Masters of Missional Leadership through Rochester College. Tr changed my perspective tremendously. And this is a group of people, uh, well, I think they, they're ready to skip through that. But you can kind of see my amazing Photoshop skills there. I, I added two of the people that were not there in the, in the picture. Uh, if you want some Photoshop help, just come, come talk to me. I can help you with that. Uh, but it, just incredible group of brothers and sisters uh, who are dedicating to uh, themselves to learn the Bible and to be able to better serve their churches and ministries. Amen? Well, today we're talking about onward in the Holy Spirit. And I want all of us to turn over to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. You know, it's well established that the Spirit, the pneuma, Greek word for air in motion, breath, wind, connoting the invisible yet palpably impulsive power of the Holy Spirit is prominent front and center in the narrative of the book of Acts written by Luke. You know, we had a discussion earlier on this year with our, our leadership team in the Lifeway ministry, talking about what is our understanding of the Trinity? What is a, our understanding of the Godhead? And what is our understanding of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit among us? And uh, Reese Nealon spoke up as someone who, has, who grew up in a traditional church of Christ, who grew up with the roots of the restoration movement. He said, you know what, growing up, for me, I always saw the Holy Spirit as sort of the red-headed stepchild of the Trinity. It was always the Holy Spirit spoke, but only through the Bible, only through the Word of God. And so it was a little bit of disconnect. But when I, when I joined the campus ministry movement in Gainesville, I saw renewed emphasis in the work of the Holy Spirit. I, saw us, I heard us talking about the Holy Spirit. 
And so if you have then come into our fellowship of churches, we are very well versed in the talk of the Holy Spirit and talking about what the Holy Spirit is doing or what the Holy Spirit wants to do among us. But I, I really believe that we have room to grow, amen? I think we, we all can say very confidently that, that the Spirit work in our, in our conversions, that when God led us to Christ, led us to change our lives, the Spirit was working even before we were ever baptized. You remember, right? All the events, all the stuff that happened, all that God did in your life, all your experiences led to that moment of conversion through the Holy Spirit and to God's family. We've seen miracles, movement of God's Spirit, and even challenges. But, you know, a lot of times we think about the Holy Spirit in the past tense. The Holy Spirit did this. The Holy Spirit did that. Or I saw how the Holy Spirit did this. And we discern it, but in the past. And I believe God wants us to, us to discern the Spirit in the present. To discern the Spirit in the future. To see where the Spirit is leading, where the Spirit is going ahead of us. And I think as church leaders, that is so essential. For us to join the work of the Holy Spirit. As he's working to change the world through the sending of the, our missional God. Amen. Acts chapter 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the time or days the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men, two angels, dressed in white, stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. Amen? Now, I can relate with this. If I would have been in, in, in that gathering, and I would have seen Jesus begin to levitate off the ground, and see Jesus begin to ascend into heaven, and rise slowly up into the sky, and rise through the clouds, I think all of us would be just as dumbfounded looking up into the sky, saying, whoa, this is amazing. This is our risen Lord. You know, but what do we see in this beginning of this book of the acts of the Holy Spirit, of the apostles through the work of the Holy Spirit, of the church through the leading of the Holy Spirit? You know, we see these things in, in that very first, the very first couple of ver, uh, verses. It says that after instruction, after giving instruction to the Holy Spirit, he began to teach them until the day he was taken to heaven. You know, I, I find this fascinating. The fact that this is resurrected Jesus. This is Jesus in the glorified body of the resurrection, in the new creation body. And yet we see the interrelationship of the Godhead. We see Jesus still speaking to them, giving them instructions through the Holy Spirit. You know, when, they, when we talk about that interrelationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we talk about a cruciformity of self-giving, something that we are all invited into, which is amazing. It's many times described as a dance, a dance that you and I can join, a dance of relationship between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that we could all join into. Amen? And then it says that he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. You know, Luke, in Luke's narrative throughout the book of Luke and through the book of, of Acts, he's painting a narrative. He's, he's really doing theology. He's doing to a theology about 
this corrupt generation. And many times he mentions this corrupt generation that kills their prophets. That kills their prophets and then memorializes them. Then makes statues of them and then remembers them. But, but yet they killed them, but then now they memorialize them. But there was a problem here because they did not kill the prophet. They killed the son of God. And there was a, even a, a greater problem because this time the son of God who they killed did not stay dead. Amen. That messes up the plan just a little bit. And so he was given many convincing proofs that he was alive. And he spoke about the kingdom of God. Jesus wanted to make sure that the apostles understood that they understood that his death and resurrection had ushered in a new history, altering reality. The reign of God that would find its expression in the church. A contrast community. Salt of the earth, light of the world. In Acts 2.42, we see a picture of the church. The church and the power of the Holy Spirit. A different kind of reign under a different kind of power. Amen? It continues on and it says, on one occasion while he was eating with them. He gave them this command. I love it. You know, Jesus, resurrected, glorified body, still bearing the wounds of the cross, sitting down and eating with the disciples. You know, this is a theme and in, in also in Luke. that The kingdom would be evident through, the ta through table fellowship, through life-changing, barrier-breaking hospitality that happens around the table of fellowship. You know, when I was a, a, a very, very young Christian, I figured out pretty, uh, pretty quickly that uh, I was not really a good cook at all. And so I kind of figured out that if I showed up at the Fuquay's house, kind of around dinner time, I might be invited for dinner with them. And so on one occasion, just kind of the, the language of Acts, you know, on one occasion I, I go and stop by, you know, Marty and Chris's house, and, and I knock on the door, and, and uh, Marty says, hey, what's up, what are you doing? He's like, oh, not much, what are you doing? He's like, oh, well, we're about to have dinner. Why don't you come in? Well, don't mind if I do. And so, you know, I, 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 I uh, welcome the invitation of, of fellowship together and table fellowship. And I come in uh, to their home, and I sit down, and I notice that Chris is not there yet. And Marty was actually doing the cooking. And, and I got to tell you, Marty is an awesome cook. If you have not tried Marty's mac and cheese, you are missing out. He, I mean, he's good. He's good. He's a culinary artiste is what I tell him. So, so then I'm waiting, and then uh, Chris is going out for a run. She comes in. She comes in all sweaty from running, and she goes to the refrigerator. And I, I'm a young Christian, new in the church. She goes to the refrigerator, opens the refrigerator, pops open a beer, downs the entire beer. And I am sitting there kind of like the apostles, you know, looking up the ascension. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there dumbfounded. And I said, I love this church. I mean, wow. This is truly the kingdom of God. But we see this table fellowship. It says, uh, then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set up by his own authority, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And you will see a couple of very important themes that Luke is about to develop throughout those first, especially 15 chapters of the book of Acts. And one of those is the restoration of Israel. There's been a big misreading in the book of Acts that I think a lot of us have, have believed that the story of God's church is really a story of the rejection of the gospel and of Jesus by the Jews. And so God has to scrap that plan and come up with a new plan. And so, hey, let's do the church now and let's have a new covenant. And, and you, know, you know, the Jews reject us, so now here comes the Gentiles. But we see Luke, time after time, making sure that we understand that God is truly restoring Israel, that God is really working hard to make sure the entire number of Israels come in to the kingdom of God. And that kingdom of God then, us as Gentiles, will be grafted in to the covenant promises of God's people. You know, and Luke does uh, uh, so much to make sure that this happens. 
First of all, by detailing all the mass conversions of Jewish believers. God-fearing Jews. You know, we see that in Jerusalem, 3,000. Then we have 5,000. Then we have 5,000 men. And then we have, I mean, they go on to Judea. They go on to Samaria. I mean, brother and sister, Jewish believers, Jewish, God-fearing Jews coming to faith in God. And so he wants to, us to understand that God is truly restoring Israel. This is good news for us. This is good news because then we are part of the narrative of God never giving up on his people, on God fulfilling his promises, of God fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament. Amen? You know, another thing that we see here is the fact that, yes, these restored Israel will now be a light to the Gentiles. That the promise of Abraham that through your seed all nations will be blessed. And we see this going from this, this outpost of God's kingdom to the entire world. It's a theme in the book of Acts. Amen? Amen. Onward in the Holy Spirit. You know, we're going to be talking about the work of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does among us. And I want to mention to you this morning two basic things. One of those is what posture should we approach the Holy Spirit with? What posture as a minister, as a leader, as a child of God should we approach our relationship with the Godhead, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And then I want to talk about some practices, practices of life in the Holy Spirit. Amen? You know, look at, the, look at this scripture here in Acts chapter 1, 4 through, 6, 4 through 6. It says, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. You know, what does Jesus say? He says, wait. Wait until you will receive power from on high. It's important to see here what Jesus didn't say. He didn't say, hey, go come up with a plan. He didn't say, you guys need to have a, a strategy-making session. He didn't say, go get yourselves organized. He simply said, wait. You know, as leaders, sometimes we're not very good at waiting. Uh, or maybe I should say it better, we're not good at patiently waiting. Like we're waiting, we have to. But we're not really good at patiently waiting. And so the first posture in approaching the Spirit is a posture of patience. Now think about this. Urgency is not a gift of the Holy Spirit. Patience is. But you know, there's a, there's a, there's a promise in waiting. And the promise is wa in waiting is that we will receive power from on high. Are you waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit? Are you patiently waiting for the Spirit to work in your life, in your ministry, in your church? Would you recognize this power when it comes? You know, I think undoubtedly we do need a greater pneumatology, a greater understanding of the Spirit and its work, a dependence on the Spirit in our church leadership. But it comes with a posture of patience. A posture of waiting, a posture of learning how to wait patiently for God to work through the Holy Spirit. Amen? The second posture that we see is the surprising work of the Spirit in Acts chapter 10. You know, we're not going to read the entire chapter, but a lot of us are familiar with the story. Cornelius, a Roman, a Gentile, has a vision of an angel of God telling him his prayers were heard. And that he should go meet Peter. Peter has a vision the next day of, of, a, of a sheet coming down from heaven with all kinds of four-footed animals. As well as reptiles and birds. After which he hears a voice say, Peter, get up. Kill and eat. All the Texans love that passage. <laughs> Peter protests. Then he hears, I mean, he begins like, what? No, we can't do that. Those, those are unclean. And he hears a voice that says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. You know, interestingly, Peter has the very same vision three times. I don't know what it is about Peter and three, three times in the number three. 
But after this, then Peter goes to see Cornelius. And notice what happens as he, as he tells and retells the story. We see here in Acts chapter 10, he, he, he meets Cornelius and he says, he said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with our, or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So we already see Peter receives a vision from the Holy Spirit. Already he is discerning and interpreting and thinking, well, what does this mean? He gets this call from Cornelius. He goes over there to meet him. And as he's traveling and he comes in, he says, well, I really shouldn't come to this house, but I had this vision of, of, of the sheet. I thought I was talking about eating, but now I'm in here in this home with the Gentiles. And he says, you know what? I think God is showing me something that I should knock out anyone, not just anything, anyone impure or unclean. You know, after this, he says that Be uh, Peter began to speak I now realize how true it is. You know, then, then Peter starts speaking and kind of telling the story. And then he, as he's telling the story, he starts discerning, you know, I think there's more to this vision. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. I mean, this is radical. As Peter discerns, as Peter retells and retells a story, the narrative, the story of God's work through the Holy Spirit becomes clearer and clearer. You know, and then he goes on. He has to defend himself against the Judaizers who are criticizing him for going and eating in the house of an unclean person. And he, and he tells them in, in Acts 11, as I began to speak, tell the story, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them. And he had... Come, as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered. So now, now Peter's kind of doing comparison. Now he's saying, hey, this kind of looks like this. It reminds me of this. Then I remember what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's Way. See, his understanding is getting clearer and clearer. It's not just about eating something. It's not even about accepting. It's about God's will for all mankind. And, you know, the response there after uh, Peter's discourse is when they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, so then, even to Gentiles, God has granted Repentance that leads to life. You know, what is the next posture that we need to have in the spirit? Is the posture of discernment. You know, this is the story really of one of the most important conversions in the book of Acts. But the question is, who was converted? Now, we all know that Cornelius was converted. But he wasn't the only one converted to God's plan, God's design, God's desire, the Holy Spirit's movement. Who was closer to what God desires between Cornelius and Peter at the very beginning of the story? Cornelius was. Peter was the outsider. Peter didn't really understand what was going on. He's the one that needed to be converted into the work of the Holy Spirit. And understand that God was doing something bigger, something greater, something deeper, something life and ministry altering that he needed to come in contact with. You know, discernment is understanding the spirit goes ahead of us. That, yeah, we can discern and look back and say, wow, I remember the spirit did this, and I remember the spirit did that. But it's also by discerning that the spirit is going ahead of us, that the spirit is working in our churches right now. He's saying, well, my, my church really is not doing much. Well, the spirit's doing stuff. He's actually doing a lot of stuff. But it's all about, uh, all about us discerning what is the Spirit doing in my church? What is the Spirit doing in my community? Because God is working in your community. I, well, I thought that the Spirit only worked among the believers. Well, we see in this example in, in Acts 10 that that's not the truth. God is working in the community because he wants God's Spirit to move in the community for conversion. And 
so we need to discern what is God doing in the community that I could join in? What is the Spirit doing in my community that I can join in? Instead of trying to create something new, why not join what the Spirit is doing? Amen? I mean, isn't this exciting? In your life, in your church, in your community, a posture of discernment. It's discernment to join the work of the Holy Spirit. And this discernment puts us in a posture of humility. It puts us in a posture of weakness. That we go, but we go in weakness. We go in the need of God. We go in the need of the Spirit's power. We don't totally understand everything. We don't have all the answers. God does. And so we go in weakness. We go in fear and trembling. As Paul said, because we are following the leadership of the Spirit of God in our lives, in our ministries, and in our community. Have you had this happen to you? Have you had a moment of conversion by the Holy Spirit after your conversion into salvation of your baptism? Where, you know, stuff happened to you, stuff happened in your ministry, stuff happened in your life. Well, God changed your perspective. God changed your emphasis. God changed your life. God changed the way you look at things. Yes, you have. We all have. And what I'm saying is we need to keep having that. And maybe some of us are having it right now. Maybe some of us are saying, well, you know, God is, he, he's been working here. And I believe the spirit is changing my perspective. He's changing my life. He's converting me to his will. And isn't that what we want, not, uh, not our will, but God's will be done. You know, final posture we see in the historic document in Acts chapter 15. And in Acts chapter 15, we find the uh, following dilemma. It says, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into a sharp dispute and, and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. You know, this led to an amazing deliberation in the council of Jerusalem. Amazing unity and agreement in spite of sharp dispute and diversion, divergent visions, culminating in an amazing letter, declaring that the Gentiles could participate in the covenant promises of God's people as Gentiles. That they need not convert to Judaism to find salvation, but that they could come in into God's covenant promises with God's people as Gentiles. Now, I know we hear this today and we think, well, yeah, of course, I mean, none of us had to become Jews to become saved. But this was radical for the church in the first century. This was a revealing of God's glory for all nations, of the Jews being a light to the Gentiles. This is huge. It's a high point in the book of Acts. Of all the highs that we see in the book of Acts, Acts 15 for Luke, as he builds his narrative, it's a high point. But look at that posture of the Holy Spirit and in the Holy Spirit that we see in the letter from these brothers in Jerusalem. It says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrifice to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. And we all say, amen. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. It's a brief letter with a clear and brief conclusion. But what is the posture we see here? It's the posture of humility. You know, it's interesting that in that letter, they, they make sure to write, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. They don't say, the Holy Spirit through us thus declares. The Holy Spirit has told us this. They say, you know, it seemed good to the Spirit. 
spirit first, and to us, that this is what you guys should all do. In other words, that this is what seemed good, but maybe God will open us greater discernment. Maybe we'll understand better later. Maybe we'll understand more. But as for now, this is the best we can do. Farewell. Fare thee well. In other words, I hope it really works out for you. Amen. You know, there's a humility there. There's a, it's not declarative. It's open to being wrong. It's the posture of humility and grace in the spirit. There's like, hey, listen, as we say this as leaders, give us some grace. Because we don't know everything. It, it just seems good to the spirit and to us. You know, we need Acts 15, 38 moments in our life and in our ministries. Moments where we're, work, we're, we're joining the work and surprise of the spirit. Where we can follow the spirit's prompting. Where we, we, where we will move ahead in weakness, but in the power of the spirit of God. Let's talk about some practices. Practices of the spirit and life in the spirit, prayer. You read the book of Acts. Great things, great miracles happen because of prayer. Prayer is central to the work of the Spirit. Prayer is that posture of weakness. Prayer is that posture of discernment. Prayer is that posture of patience in God's power. Prayer is that invitation for God to lead us in a direction maybe different than our own. Prayer is Jesus saying, let not my will be done but yours. You know, I think about my wife. My wife uh, leaves our home very early in the morning. She's an early riser. I'm a late sleeper. Always been. And I've tried to change. So for me to wake up at 6.30 in the morning, which is kind of when I do, I'm actually pretty proud of myself. But my wife, she wakes up early. She uh, gets, uh, you know, some shorts on, some shoes. She goes out to a park in the neighborhood, Lacey Park. And uh, she's gone for a couple hours. And then she, she comes back, and, and, uh, and I say, hey, uh, what's going on? She says, oh, I was just praying. Oh, really? How, how long did you pray? Well, I kind of walked around five miles, and I prayed. And I'm thinking, wow, this is a woman of God. This is a woman of God not because of who she is in Christ, although that's very, very big, not because of her conversion, not because of the great mom she is or the great wife that she is or the great ministry leader that she is but because she has a conviction of her need in prayer. You know, that's a practice of the Spirit. You know, practice of the Spirit is boldness. You say, well, Raphael, it's a little bit confusing because you said we got to go in weakness and we got to go in fear and trembling and, and we got to go in need. Boldness? Yeah, boldness. But you know why it's boldness? Because it's not about you. Because it's not, it's not you. It's the Holy Spirit. It's power from on high. And let me tell you, that's better power. Right? We know the song, Jesus has the power. Right? I'm not a good singer, but hey, I'm, I'm trying. But what do we see in Acts? Boldness. Boldness in the life of disciples. Boldness because of the right reliance and trust in the Holy Spirit. In spite of being unschooled, ordinary men. They understood the promise of Jesus that, hey, listen, I will speak for you. The Spirit will intercede for you. The Spirit will give you words to say, don't worry, I will be with you to the very end of the age. You know, another practice that's important for a congregation is a scriptural, a scriptural imagination. We're not going to be able to be people of the Spirit if we don't have a developed scriptural imagination. You're saying, well, Raphael, that sounds kind of fancy. What does that mean? What that means is, if we are not in our Bible, we're not going to have a great discernment of the Spirit of God. We all remember, when we were young, young Christians, I remember going to midweeks at UCLA with all the rest of the brothers in West LA in Culver City Rec Center. And going over there, and, and then a brother coming up to me and saying, hey, bro, listen, I read the scripture. And, and he, he kind of leans, he goes like this. And you know why he's going like that? Because there were no chairs around. Because he wants me to come down and we got to talk about the scripture right now. 
And he says, hey, you know, I read the scripture. What do you think it means? And I'm like, well, you know, it's, it's clear to me what it means. I mean, it's, no, I didn't say that. I was like, well, let's read it. Let's, but there was talk of the, of the Bible, talk of the scriptures. We were like, hey, listen to what I just read. Listen to what I just learned. Hey, what was your quiet time about? What did you learn? What are you learning? You know, what you get from man in the morning? I mean, was that awesome or what? But I believe as I look around even our fellowship, and I don't want to, you know, paint a broad brush against all of ours. Maybe in, in your church there is a great scriptural imagination. But I see, I see such a weakness in the Bible. Such a weakness in discerning the spirit. Such a dependence on Sunday morning preaching. And sometimes the Sunday morning preaching is, is a little bit anemic as well. So it's kind of anemia feeding anemia, and I don't know what that would be, a pneumonia or something like that, but <laughs> starvation. We're not going to see the Holy Spirit's work until we develop an ecology of the word, an environment of the Bible, an environment of the scriptures, an environment of discerning what is God saying to me, of going in there and, and, and breaking it down to your context, to what's happening in your life. You know, I also believe that a, a, a practice of the Spirit is unity. I mean, think about the challenges. Think about the altering of perception of what it means to be a people of God. Think about, I mean, Barnabas and Paul, think about how messy it was. It's kind of messy. But you know what you see all throughout? is the Spirit loves unity. You know, I, I believe we can disagree. I believe we can have different opinions. But we absolutely cannot be disunified. We cannot. And maybe you think, well, you know, it's because, I don't know, maybe we need to go our separate ways. Where is that? How is that life in the spirits? You know, the, the, the posture of the Spirit, the priority of the Spirit is unity. You know, what else do we see as a practice of the Spirit is all nations. Look around. Look around. You know, as we're studying in this uh, Masters of, of uh, uh, Missional Leadership, we have a great cohort. Our cohort is incredibly diverse. And you know what they tell us is, you guys know what, I mean, what, what we love about your churches, they're like, don't change this. Learn all you want to learn, but please don't change this. You know what they say for us not to change? Vince, Vince, you know, Vince Hawkins, he knows. says, one, don't change your evangelistic zeal. And we're like, oh, man, we kind of need to repent a little bit right now. But <laughs> amen, you know, that's encouraging. But you know what else they say? Don't change your diversity. Now, I know we got work to do, and I know we're doing work, and that's awesome. But do not miss the work of the Spirit in our incredible diversity, not just in the U.S., but worldwide. God is awesome in our fellowship. Amen? There are churches that believe that maybe uh, being just of one race in a congregation is, is what's, what's best. Maybe it isn't good to be mixed. Maybe, you know, you won't feel comfortable in the Spirit if you're mixed. You know, I never really learned that the Spirit wants us to be comfortable. I never really saw that. I never really saw. Now, he is the comforter, but it's a little bit of a conundrum, isn't it? Because I believe he comforts us through the will of God. But not to be comfortable. And so we enjoy an incredible diversity. Why? Because of table fellowship. Because of hospitality with one another because of opening our homes to, pe to different people, different types of people. And God has done this, and it's great, but are you still doing it? Are you doing it in your community? Are you ignoring entire populations in your city? You know, for some of us, we are, our church is actually in a neighborhood that speaks a different language. And all our members come into that area that speaks a different language. And guess what? We don't think, maybe we should reach out to the other people that are around our church building that speak a different language. We've kind of gotten to the point that 
maybe another church is going to reach out to them. I really hope they're saved someday. You know, I don't really believe the doctrine is great, but God is powerful. Do you still believe in all nations that this is the Spirit's mission we must be committed to? It's not just about your area. It's not just about your location. It's about the entire world. It's about all of us. It's community. That is the power of God's reign, God's life-altering, perspective-changing reign in the Spirit of God. Amen? You know, I want to kind of land the plane here. Talking about building oars or making sails. You know, the traditional misreading of the book of Acts is in our legacy, really in the restoration movement, is as a pattern to be repeated. And so what's this pattern of the book of Acts? Let's try to follow that pattern. It's a blueprint reading instead of a joining of a life in the surprising power of the Holy Spirit. See, we are really tempted, usually, and, and, and I'm not, I, I am tempted. I'm tempted right now in my congregation. We're, we're doing some changes. We're trying to do some things. And I am tempted to build oars instead of building sails. Because building oars is safer. Building oars ensures me that we're relying on human power because I don't know whether God really agrees whether we're going or not. I have more control. I have a structure that I can depend on. That, that I, I know works. Is it like this, Todd? You know, but the book of Acts is a story of our first century brothers and sisters making sails to catch the life-changing power of the Holy Spirit. When this happens, you might feel like this. And I'm saying, if you're not feeling like this, you're not living life in the Holy Spirit. So I say, onward. Onward as church family. Onward together. Onward in boldness. Onward in prayer. Onward to all nations in the power of the Holy Spirit. May God bless you in this conference and your ministry to your churches throughout the world. Amen.